Hello, and welcome to another lecture from my class, PSYC 440-640, the class that's called Experimental Methods, but is really more of a class about univariate data analytic techniques from a kind of a model comparisons perspective. And as I normally do, I'm beginning this class with a comic from the excellent webcomic series PhDcomics.com that pokes a little bit of fun at the relationship that grad students often have <clears throat> with their major professors. And if you're in grad school, if you've ever been in grad school, you kind of get the humor here. If not, just trust us. It's a, it's a unique relationship. So before getting into the main part of the lecture, I want to touch on a point that I made last time by way of a, a quick review. Um, that point concerned outliers, and last time I tried to make the case that outliers are a potential source of bias. That is, they can lead the calculations we make in our sample of data, the statistics that we compute, to misrepresent, to over or underestimate values in the population of all data, parameters. Um, and to be clear, when I say statistics, I mean almost any sort of calculation we can make in this class. So descriptive statistics like means and standard deviations, um, <clears throat> test statistics, effect sizes, even the components of models, regression coefficients. These are all calculations that we make based on data that we have, our sample, and they're meant to reflect or to estimate um, what those values would be in the entire population of data. Now, we can't have that entire population of data, but sometimes in statistics, you know, the field of statistics that is, we fiddle around or try to play with that idea of a population via simulation. And that's kind of what I wanted to do uh, uh, in this lecture, or at least to, to by way of an illustration in this lecture. And specifically what I mean is, in just in Excel, I was playing around one day and I created a population of a thousand cases um, that had, uh, each of which had a value for a variable X and a variable Y. And I tried to make sure that these variables were normally distributed. And you can see here on the left side of the, uh, of the slide, this is essentially the summary statistics for all the data. So you can see the full thousand cases um, values, uh, the mean and the standard deviation, and the upper and lower values, the skew and kurtosis, etc., for variable X and variable Y. So imagine that that's the entire population of data, all the data that we could ever have, and it just happens to be the case in that population that the correlation between those two variables is about 0.5. You can see the little uh, regression equation at the bottom there if you were trying to predict values of Y based on values of X. Um, <clears throat> then what I did just repeatedly is I had a little function that would sample 12 cases at a time from that uh, population of a thousand and make all those computations again. So create statistics uh, for all those parameters. And so you can see here, this is just one example on the right of the screen, uh, one time that I sampled. So I got 12 cases and I got means and standard deviations and highs and lows and skews and kurtosis and correlations and regression coefficients and so on for just that one sample. And by just repeatedly sampling, clicking the button to kind of iterate through sample after sample, it wasn't too long before I found samples that really didn't accurately reflect the population. So the statistics I was computing were a little bit off with respect to the parameters that they were meant to estimate. So you can see here in this one particular sample, the means are a little bit different, especially on variable X. Um, you know, the correlation's different. These variables, X and Y, are more highly correlated in the sample than they really should be in the sense of how they are in the whole population. If you want to visualize what this looks like, or I wanted to visualize what this looks like, so I made a scatter plot. The uh, blue dots there are all the thousand data points in the population, and the kind of orangey uh, yellow dots are the 12 cases that I pulled out. And you can see they're, they're a sample from that broader population. And uh, you can see, kind of a little bit obscured, I suppose, a blue line that reflects the model, uh, the simple regression of um, the outcome variable y on the predictor variable x in the population. And then you can see in the kind of orangey yellow color that same model except based on our sample. And so you can see fairly easily, especially if you look at the regression equations, which are at the top and bottom of the figure, how those um, values for those regression coefficients in our sample are a little bit off. They're misrepresenting or they're misestimating 
the values for those regression coefficients in the population. And you could imagine if this was not a simulation, but like a real study, and you just gathered those 12 people, you might conclude that there's a rather strong relationship between uh, X and Y. And whether you realize it or not, you'd be a little bit wrong. You know, the relationship in the entire population of data is actually a little bit more modest. So that's one thing to just notice here. And this happens every time we sample. You know, this is the definition of sampling error. You know, every time we draw a sample from a population and compute anything, those uh, calculations are always going to be a little bit off. And uh, you know, how off they are is, uh, is a matter of, of interest to, to, to statisticians. That's something we spend a lot of time thinking about. Now, in this particular example, part of the problem here comes from this one data point that I've kind of highlighted. This data point, a little dot of orangey yellow sort of down to the lower left, is uh, an outlier with respect to the other values of the data in the sample. So it's a little bit off. And you can kind of get the sense just from looking at the two lines for the model and the population and the model and the sample, how that one data point is kind of dragging, if you will, the model off its mark. It's kind of pulling the orange line down away from where it should be, which ideally would be more or less lined up perfectly with the blue line. So who is this particular case, this, this kind of apparent outlier? Well, it happens to be um, ID number 73, like, that is 73 out of a thousand, and he or she or it, you know, it's, it's just data I made up, um, or the data that I had Excel sort of randomly generate for me. Um, that's a person who happens to have rather low scores on both variables, at least as compared to all the other people in the sample. And, and just to be clear here, because I'm using such a small sample, sample size 12, I used interquartile ranges to kind of identify sort of um, median, high, and low values for each of those variables. You can kind of see that down at the bottom. Um, and the point is, you know, I've kind of highlighted our particular person here, ID number 73 in red, because he or she is lower um, than the first quartile on both of those two uh, variables, particularly on values for variable Y. Now let's imagine we get rid of that case. We just delete him. Um, and that, of course, is easy to do in a simulation. If this was real data, if you were really sampling uh, from a population and running some analyses for a master's thesis or a dissertation, you shouldn't just willy-nilly delete cases because you think they're outliers. Uh, you should probably have a pretty good reason for that. And as I've talked about in previous lectures, I think the two major reasons why you might want to delete a case or, or filter out a case from your analyses is either because you have good reason to believe that there were methodological problems, you know, measurement errors associated with that data gathering for that case, or if you think there's good reason to believe that that case really isn't part of the population you're sampling. So if this case, in, you know, case number 73, really should be part of some different population uh, in the universe and somehow ended up in my data set, in my sample from this other population that I'm principally interested in, I might want to get rid of him or get rid of her. Um, in this case, it's just a simulation. It was just me screwing around in Excel, as I often do. And so let's just assume that I have a pretty good reason to eliminate this case. Well, doing so uh, makes the sample fits the uh, population a little bit better, or at least you know the statistics that we calculate from the sample are closer to the values that they should be, that is, the parameters in the population. So if you look at things like the mean and the standard deviation, and the, especially if you look at the correlation, it's now more or less correct. That is, the sample, those uh, statistics in the sample are accurately um, estimating the parameters in the population. It, it's good. It's still not great though. It's not perfect and in a sense it never will be. So if you just wanted to visualize this you could draw uh, or you could create a scatter plot as I just did here and you can see our, our new somewhat reduced sample. There are only 11 people now um, and you can see that the there the uh, orangey yellow dots are, are more tightly bunched together. There aren't any really obvious outliers. Um, the line that describes the model for that sample is much closer uh, in both its slope and its intercept to the line in the full population of data. So it's, it's certainly an improvement with respect to how well the model is estimating um, values in the population. So a couple important points here. Um, not all outliers cause bias, and not all bias is caused by outliers. 
But as I said last time, investigating outliers can often uh, alert us to problems which may lead to bias in estimation. Um, and you know, it's often worth looking for outliers anyway. It's just you know, one of the many benefits of, of detecting and dealing with outliers is reducing some of the risk towards bias in estimation, especially if there are other things which might lead to bias in estimation, like uh, violations of assumptions. Those tend to get much worse when outliers are present. Um, another point to make here, and I've kind of noted this at the bottom, is that all these problems, problems of outliers, problems of violated assumptions, all are a lot, lot, lot worse in small samples of data. To illustrate that, here's just one sample that I got. You know, again, I'm working in Excel here. I'm just clicking the space bar to repeatedly sample 12 at a time from my population of a thousand data points. And you know, it wasn't very long. I was just like, click, 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 click. All of a sudden, boom, I got this sample which is just really weird. I mean, it's maybe the case that there are a couple outliers here. If you kind of squint, there seems to be a kind of a low lying case kind of towards the bottom right, if you will. But the overall gist of this sample is it's just a really odd group of folks with respect to the population. And if you look at the um, regression equation for the population in blue and then compare it to the regression equation for the population or for the sample in orangey yellow, uh, you would get a sense of how big that uh, that uh, bias is. You know, in the sample it looks like there's essentially no relationship between the predictor variable and the outcome, even though in a sense there really should be because in the full population of data there absolutely is a relationship. Um, why does this happen? Well, it's just dumb luck. It's sampling variation or sampling error, which is worse if you have small samples, samples of sample size 12. I don't think I made a slide of this, but I basically repeated this little exercise, uh, you know, fiddling around in Excel as I often do, except instead of sampling 12 at a time, I sampled 100 at a time, and I almost never got a sample that was really off with respect to the population. You know, all my st sample statistics were pretty good and, uh, and as far as I could tell, unbiased estimates of population parameters. Um, just simply illustrating, or I, I hope, or, or me explaining, I hope, uh, in a way that you understand that uh, small samples are the worst. They have all sorts of problems. Uh, they're more susceptible to problems with outliers. They're more susceptible to problems with violations of assumptions. We know, I think, on an almost intuitive level that they're less likely to kind of accurately reflect the overall population. So. Um, yet another reason or yet another reminder to not use small samples in your analyses or in your or in your research because by the time you get to your analyses you know you may have some significant problems which you can't fix okay with all that kind of uh, lecturing and admonishing out of the way let's move on to the main portion of this lecture this is called introduction to multiple regression because eventually i'm going to talk a little bit about multiple regression that is cases or, or uh, analyses in which there is one outcome variable as there pretty much always is but there are two or more predictor variables uh, now before i get there i want to talk more about regression diagnostics which is this big topic that I, I began to talk about last time. So um, in a sense, hold on because we will get to uh, multiple regression towards the end of the lecture and we will be talking about it or I will be talking about more in future, in future lectures. But before we get there, there's some other important stuff to touch upon. <clears throat> so by way of an overview for the remaining portion of this lecture, I want to talk a little bit about assessing model fit, that is trying to decide how well the model that we make in our sample of data fits that sample of data. You know, we're not even yet really worried so much about the population, although we, we do worry about that as well. But kind of thinking a little bit about how well our model fits our data, how much the model is being influenced by outliers uh, and residuals and so-called influential cases, which I'll talk about a little bit. And then, as I mentioned just a slide back, uh, I will start to talk a little bit about multiple regression, and I'll use that example uh, from the Andy Field textbook. I, sh I should say, um, the regression uh, chapter in the Field textbook, I think, is really good. Um, the only thing that's a bit odd is I think he skips the topic of centering predictor variables, or at least the last time I, I looked, I didn't see it. Otherwise, though, I think it's a really good chapter and covers a lot of really interesting stuff. So if you're in my class, by all means, be reading that chapter. If you're not in my class and you're looking for a good sort of introductory level textbook for statistics, uh, I really uh, highly recommend uh, Andy Field's Discovering Statistics uh, using SPSS, especially the chapters on regression, because I think they're really quite good.
Okay, assessing model fit. So when we, we try to assess model fit, we can think about the overall fit of the model. That is, um, you know, R squared, you know, how much of the variability in the outcome variable is explained by the predictor variable or is associated with the predictor variable. If we want to kind of reach beyond just the fit of our model to the sample of data and think about how well our model fits the population of all data, we can use adjusted R squared. Um, we can also use a calculation called delta or change in R squared, which really is more of an issue for multiple regression and I'll really get to more in the next uh, lecture. We can also think about specific data points, specific cases or, or people in our data set that influence how much the data, uh, I'm sorry, how much the model fits the data. So we can examine outliers and residuals because we can, we should, we should be kind of thinking about the amount by which the model misses specific data points. Like, are there cases in our data set that the model just does a bad job with, you know, especially bad as compared to all the other data points? The, we can think of these as like specific points of error. And we can also look for what are called influential cases. These are cases which sort of pull the model towards them or influence the way the model is constructed or the, the parameter estimates that become part of the model, the slopes and the intercept of the model. Um, as we'll see a little bit later in this lecture, it's like all the data points in our data set are fighting to control where the model goes. All the data points would like the line that is the model to pass through them and only them. Um, and, and in that kind of scrum, in that fight, it is sometimes the case that some data points have a disproportionate um, effect or disproportionate pull on the model as compared to the other ones. Those influential cases are sometimes influential because they're outliers or sometimes they can occur, they can be influential for other reasons. In any case, we often want to identify who they are and see if they co constitute sort of specific points of bias in estimation. So if all of that seems a little bit abstract or a little bit hard to follow, don't worry, I'm going to try and take this relatively slowly. And so the first part of assessing model fit has to do with looking for outliers and residuals. We've already talked a little bit about this in the last lecture, so hopefully some of this will seem like kind of a bit of a review. So if we're looking for cases that are outliers in terms of their residuals, um, one of the first things we can do is get SPSS or Excel or R, pretty much any stats program, to give us the values of the unstandardized residuals. That is the differences between the predicted and observed values on the outcome variable for each of the cases in our data set. These are, again, they're called residuals or they're sometimes called deviations. And sometimes just by eyeballing these values, we can find large residuals or residuals that seem uh, unusually big or unusually big, like in the negative direction, you know, big in terms of their absolute value, I guess I should say. Um, a challenge here is this works best when our outcome variable is in the metric, which has a natural and easy to understand um, well, our, when our outcome variable has a natural and easy to understand metric. So if we're trying to predict as our outcome variable number of drinks per week, uh, that's a, you know, a metric that I think all of us can understand going from zero drinks per week to, you know, however many is a very large and dangerous number of drinks to have per week. Um, if we see that a particular case has a, a uh, residual of like negative 12, we might think, wow, you know, the model is 12 drinks per week off in terms of predicting that one case. That seems like a lot to me just in terms of the natural metric of drinks per week. Um, often though in psychology, we don't have outcome variables which have the easy to understand metric. We might have an outcome variable that's like a score on a questionnaire. Um, so it's, you know, obviously larger values mean more and smaller values mean less, but we sometimes struggle to really understand how big is big. It depends on the metric of the outcome variable. To deal with this problem, we can standardize or studentize our residuals. I talked about this a little bit last time. You know, basically what we're doing is we're taking residuals and dividing them uh, by their standard deviation, helping us to evaluate the size of them. Um, and if we assume that our residuals are normally distributed, which again we normally do, then those frequencies uh, for outlying values uh, should follow, should fall roughly as follows. We should fairly rarely see uh, values uh, for standardized or pseudonized residuals that are greater than two or less than negative two, or even 
more infrequently or more rarely should we see values that are greater than 2.5 or less than negative 2.5. We should probably almost never see values that are greater than 3 or less uh, than negative 3. So again, what we're doing here is we're assuming that our errors are normally distributed. Um, and this lets us use the sum of squares error to describe our model and to evaluate different models. Um, are our errors normally distributed? Well, we shouldn't just assume this, we should probably check this out. So we can do that. I talked about this a little bit last time, but it's again worth a bit of a review. Um, we should go ahead and see whether our errors are normally distributed as we look for large values in terms of standardized or studentized residuals. So here's something for you to try. If you're enrolled in my class, uh, you can access this data set on Blackboard. If you're not, you can almost certainly, I think, access it from the website for Andy Field's uh, textbook. Um, this is the example of, um, you know, we're imagining that we're working for a record company or a music company. And we're trying to predict, um, uh, we're trying to predict uh, album sales based on advertising budget. Uh, in past lectures, uh, we went ahead and ran a simple regression to, uh, to handle this analysis. Basically, you know, going ahead and doing this again would be like analyze regression, linear outcome variable is record sales, predictor variable is advertising budget. The only thing to do a little bit differently now is to take advantage of some of the options the regression module gives us in SPSS. So for instance, if you click on the save button, you can save out the unstandardized and standardized residuals. Uh, you can also save out the studentized residuals, but as I've tried, tried to describe in previous lectures, they work kind of more or less the same as the standardized residuals. So, you know, one or the other is probably sufficient. Um, you can also click on the uh, box for plot. You can open up the little plot area and you can do some of that clever scatter plot graphing that we talked about last time, plotting standardized predicted values against standardized residuals and so on. Or we'll kind of get to that maybe a little bit later, but for right now you could just get a histogram uh, for your standardized residuals and even normal probability plots for your, your standardized residuals, so like a PP plot for your standardized residuals. Um, that's what I've done here. Obviously, I've just put little checks in those boxes and hit continue, and then back in the main work area, I hit OK, and I got a whole bunch of analyses uh, as a result. Some of the analyses I got uh, were this one here. You know, I, um, I uh, got a, uh, a uh, a histogram. Gosh, why am I struggling on that? I got a histogram for my standardized residuals, and you can see here that they have almost right away this sort of familiar bell-shaped normal curve shape distribution. In SPSS's output screen, I double-clicked on this histogram to open up the chart editor, and I clicked on the little button to superimpose a normal curve over the histogram to kind of reinforce the idea that these are fairly normally distributed. That's good because we, we assume that our errors are normally distributed. So it's nice to check that assumption. I also got a normal PP plot, um, which uh, I've talked about a little bit in past lectures, but basically this is a plot of the observed cumulative probability of the particular data points against the expected cumulative probability of these data points if they were normally distributed. Um, and so what would happen is if these residuals uh, are normally distributed, they will fall, they're the little circles, they will fall on the diagonal line that goes, uh, that sort of bisects uh, this uh, square here that is the graph. Gosh, I feel like I'm really struggling today. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's just kind of a, it's Wednesday, it's the middle of the week. I'm a bit sluggish. But anyway, the, we see here what we like to see, which is the observed uh, probabilities of all of our data points, that is all our standardized residuals, are more or less lining up with what we'd expect if they were normally distributed, which suggests, of course, that they are fairly well normally distributed. Now we can also get some of these same analyses a different way, or some of these same uh, you know, some of the same P uh, analyses through different modules in SPSS. It's convenient to work within the regression module if you're already doing a regression, but we can also do other things. For instance, we can, um, once we've saved out those standardized residuals, uh, we can go ahead and plot uh, their frequency uh, distribution. So we can get like analyzed descriptives, frequencies, and we can put 
our residuals, either standardized or unstandardized, into the workspace for frequencies. We can ask for histograms that include normal curves. Um, we can also ask for uh, calculations of skewness and kurtosis to get a sense of how skewed or kurtotic they are. We can even go into the Analyze Descriptive Statistics PP plots, and we can ask for PP plots of our residuals or our standardized residuals. Uh, you see here I've clicked, um, you know, I've clicked the uh, the variable into the box, and I've asked for a test distribution, the normal distribution. That's probably the default for this module to sort of test to see whether that distribution, in this case the residuals, is significantly different from a normal distribution. And you know, once I get these out these outputs, I can kind of click around and look for individual cases that fall outside of what I'd expect for a normal distribution of residuals. Uh, the point of this is uh, the basic idea. Uh, we should try to look at distributions of residuals because we're assuming that they're normal in, in shape. Uh, we can check that assumption. Uh, when we do that, we can also, uh, if we find our, our residuals are normally distributed, it also makes it easier for us to identify outlying values because they're the ones which will have standardized values that are very, very big or very, very big in the negative direction. Okay, so enough of me talking. Let's see if you can do this. Um, if you're enrolled in my class, you'll have access to this data set through Blackboard. If not, I'm afraid you'll just have to um, you know, play along, um, maybe use one of your own data sets and see if you can answer roughly the same questions. Here, I've just kind of made up an example of a clinical pharmacology researcher who's doing some sort of study uh, where different doses of a drug are given to different, uh, you know, uh, different human participants. And so we have a predictor variable that's drug dose, the, the amount of active ingredient in the drug, which um, I'm imagining is, is titrated at a range of 20 milligrams up to 180 milligrams. So we're treating this as kind of a continuous variable where milligrams is the metric. Um, it's not like low dose, medium dose, high dose. It's We have enough data that we've got a whole range of different doses. And our outcome variable is the drug effect, which we're kind of operationalizing as some measure of symptom level. So it's a pretty simple data set. It's data that I just made up using uh, some tricks in Excel. And so what I want you to do, uh, if you're in my class especially, is create and evaluate a model. That is, create a model that predicts symptom level from a drug dose and see is this model statistically significant, uh, what is its effect size, and what are some uh, possible uh, sources of bias in this model. Okay, so assuming that you're, you've done this a little bit, I guess you could have paused the video. Um, we're looking for sources of bias. Well, what are the sources of bias? Well, outliers are, are one thing that we all, almost always worry about or should worry about. And um, there really aren't a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of evidence of outliers in this data set. If we look at either of the two variables, they don't seem to have a lot of outliers. If we look at the residuals, uh, they don't seem to have, uh, there aren't, don't seem to be cases with the outlying values in terms of their residuals. Another source of bias, or another way bias can creep in, is if we have violations of assumptions. There don't seem to be uh, problems with violations of assumptions of normality, um, particularly the normality of the residuals. They seem to be fairly normally distributed. Also, our sample is pretty large, so we're not too awful worried about the assumption of normality. Now, of course, there are other assumptions that I've talked about, but the assumption of normality is the one that we've focused on the most recently. So. It's the one I was thinking of when I made up this slide. Anyway, the, the point here is to do a bit of practice, and I hope that this is giving you an opportunity to practice. If you're still a little bit rusty, take some more time to work on this. I think it's really important to understand um, the imp it's important to understand the importance of looking for outliers. It's important to understand how uh, the importance of looking at distributions of residuals and hopefully finding that they are normal in shape. Um, so anyway, take some time to work on this if you're struggling. If not, then let's push ahead. Another thing that we think of when we're thinking about the fit of our model is not just the presence of outliers, um, especially outliers with respect to residuals, but the presence of so-called influential cases.
Influential cases are cases that affect the values of the uh, parameter estimates of the regression coefficients in our model more than they really should. So um, you can imagine, or I sort of said this before, but I'll say it again. Uh, in, in a sense, if you have a scatter plot that's describing the relationship between two variables, this is just an image from Andy Field's textbook, then in a sense, each of those dots wants the line that is the model to pass through it. They're all kind of pulling at that line. And because of their relative position to one another, sometimes the dots, the data points, will have more or, or less pull than they really should. Um, and so in this particular case, there's an outlier here. Obviously, it's highlighted thank, uh, helpfully by our author. That outline case is pulling the line that is the model off of where it, in a sense, really should be. If that outlier didn't exist, the model would have the line, or the model would be the line that you see in dark green there. Um, it would sort of pass through sort of the middle of the cloud of dots, if you can imagine that. But the presence of that outlier kind of yanks or drags the line down a bit, pulling it off and making it a sort of a worse uh, estimator of all the other data points in the data set. In a sense, the outlier is spoiling the model a little bit for all the other cases. So if we can represent models pictographically, it's sometimes easy to see an influential case. You can kind of eyeball it, at least if it's a simple scatter plot and a simple regression. Um, but what if we uh, need to go a little bit further and ask, how can, or are there other ways we can detect influential cases, especially when we have larger data sets or more complicated data sets where it's just not convenient to make a simple scatter plot? Um, well, the good news is, yeah, we can. We can find influential cases using a variety of other different calculations. Um, one thing we can do is we can ask, what would the model look like without each case in it, if we were to go through and yank out a particular case and then rerun the model without that case in it. One way to detect influence is to get SPSS to compute adjusted predicted values. Adjusted predicted values are just uh, values that SPSS computes when it pulls out a particular case uh, from the data set temporarily and then develops a model and then uses that model to predict the value of the case that it just pulled out. So SPSS kind of goes through iteratively and pulls out ID number one, creates a model, and then uses the model to predict the value on the outcome variable that ID number one should have. And then it puts ID number one back into the data set and pulls out ID number two and repeats that process and so on and so on. So once it's done this, and of course it happens in micro fractions of a second, uh, we as the data analyst can look down that column of adjusted predicted values to detect weirdness. And by weirdness, I mean cases where there's a big difference between the original predicted value for a case, that is the value that the model based on all the data predicted that that case would have, and it's adjusted predicted value, the value that SPSS predicted for it when it was pulled out of the data set. So if a case is really uninfluential, if a, you know ID number one is not a very influential case, then the value for his or her adjusted predicted value should be more or less the same as the original value for his or her predicted value with, with, with all the, when all the data was used. Um, on the other hand, if uh, there's a big difference, let's say the adjusted predicted value for ID number two in your data set is quite different from the original predicted value, then something about ID number two really pulled off prediction or the absence of ID number two in the data set really shifts prediction for that particular case, for case ID number two. Um, and that gives you a sense of the kind of the, the, the amount of pull, the amount of influence that that particular case has. So we can kind of go down the line, you know, we go down the column looking for large values of adjusted predicted values. And when we find them, we have some evidence like, aha, uh -huh, that particular case there, she or he seems to be rather influential. A related calculation are so-called DF fits. These are just the difference between the adjusted predicted value and the original predicted value. Just, you know, do the math. Um, and you, again, they allow us to kind of get at that same idea. How much does a case influence the model's prediction of it? Well, if the case is really un uninfluential, the value for DF fits 
or the difference in fit um, should be pretty small. You know, the adjusted predicted value should be pretty close to the original predicted value and thus DF fits should be pretty small. If DF fits is large, then we have a sense of, oh boy, maybe that case was pretty, pretty uh, influential. Now it won't surprise you at this point in the semester to know that there's a standardized version of this calculation. Standardized DF fits are just that. They are standardized versions of the DF fit calculation. And the value or the utility of having a standardized version of DF fits is it just makes it a little bit easier to eyeball large values. Because remember, DF fits are in the natural metric of whatever our outcome variable is. And if the outcome variable has an easy to understand kind of metric, then maybe it's just fine to use DF fits in its original or kind of untransformed uh, uh, metric. But often in, in uh, psychology, we have outcome variables and predictor variables for that matter that are in non-obvious or non-natural metrics and standardizing can help because if we see uh, values for standardized DF fits that are large, they're say greater than two or even greater than 2.5, we know that there's a big difference between the original predicted value for that case and the adjusted predicted value. It's just an aid to us as we're scanning down the column of values looking for big values, looking for ones which should be or, or could be evidence of influence. A further calculation we can make are deleted residuals. These are just the difference between adjusted predicted values and the original observed values. So you, know, you have regular residuals, that's just the difference between the observed value and the original predicted value. Deleted residuals are a difference between the adjusted predicted value and the original observed value. Similar idea. And um, what they're giving us is a sense of how much that case influenced the model's error in prediction of it. So if a case is very uninfluential, then the deleted residual should be pretty small. That is, you know, when you have ID number two in the data set, you get a particular residual. If you pull out ID number two, run the analysis, and then try to predict ID number two, and then find the residual for that prediction, if those two values, those two residuals, the original residual and the deleted residual are pretty similar, then clearly ID number two, whatever ID number I was talking about, is not particularly influential. The model makes about the same error in predicting it when it is in the data set and when it is not in the data set. So uninfluential case. On the flip side, if pulling out ID number three really shifts the amount of error in prediction of ID number three, then there's something special about ID number three. It had a lot of influence on the amount of error that the model made in predicting it. So it's a similar idea. Another similar idea is that there's a standardized or technically a studentized version of deleted residuals. And you know, the only value here is it just makes it a little bit easier for us to read through the different values of deleted uh, residuals and find the big ones, ones which have absolute values which are greater than two or even greater than 2.5 are problematic. Uh, so if we see a deleted, I, I should say, um, a studentized deleted residual that's greater than two or less than negative two, that's gonna trouble us and think, oh boy, this case had a lot of influence on the way the model predicted it, or, or more precisely, the, the amount of error that the model made in predicting it. It was an influential case. So, so far, adjusted predicted values, uh, DF fits, standardized DF fits, deleted residuals, studentized deleted residuals, etc., etc., etc. These are all ways of analyzing or, or considering influence in terms of the effect that a particular case has on the model's pr ability to predict that case. How much ID number two influences how well or how poorly the model predicts ID number two, or so on and so on. There's kind of another way to think about influence though, and that is how much uh, the case influences how well the model predicts all the other cases in the data set. You know, does ID number two throw off the prediction of all the other cases? Because that could be a way of thinking about influence. Certainly, you know, if, if ID number two, I guess I keep on using this one example, really pulls off the prediction of all the other cases in the data set, then it's clearly influential, maybe more than it should be in terms of how the model works.
Now there are a number of calculations that can be done to look at this type of influence, influence of the case on the model's prediction of other cases. They're all a fair bit more complicated and you'll notice in my slides I don't provide as much detail about them. I just note that they exist and tell you to refer to SPSS. So one of them is called Cook's Distance. Cook's Distance is just a way of describing the effect that a single case has on the model as a whole. That is how well the model describes or predicts other cases in the data set. And uh, the rule of thumb here is that you, you can get a Cook's Distance value for each of your cases. SPSS will make it for you or compute it for you. And you just scan down the column of values looking for values that are greater than one. And by convention, values that are greater than one on Cook's Distance may indicate problems with, uh, with influence. A similar calculation is called uh, leverage or weirdly called hat values. I'm not exactly sure why that where that comes from. Um, this is just another way of getting at how much that particular case influences the prediction of all the other cases. And there's a little rule of thumb for how you interpret that. You look for values that are close to one. You know, one would be for leverage would indicate total influence. Like that case is perfectly or, or you know, in a perfect disproportion pulling off the estimation or the prediction of all the other cases. You can also compute the average leverage of all the cases and you can look for cases which have greater than the average value of leverage. Like you sort of take the average of all the leverages for all the different cases in your data set and then look for values that have, or individual cases that have really large amounts of leverage respect, with respect to all the other leverage that all the other cases have. And again, there's some rules of thumb here. You probably get the sense at this point in my uh, lecture that discussions of influence are not a, uh, do not have precise rules. It's not like, well, you know, if you observe this value and it equals this, then there's a problem. It's more like uh, you're a detective looking for evidence of influence. And there are different sources of evidence, and some of them are easier to discern than others. And so leverage is a calculation. It's got some rules of thumb associated with it. It's an interesting point. Cook's uh, values, uh, Cook's distances, I'm sorry, and leverage measure influence in terms of the model's ability to predict other cases, uh, but they don't always agree perfectly with each other um, because they measure leverage in different ways, ways that I'm not entirely clear on. It's been a while since I've thought about, or certainly even even longer since I've looked at the formula for these various calculations. But again, you know, I like to imagine or use the metaphor of the detective. You're looking for multiple sources for the crime, the crime of influence, multiple bits of evidence. By the way, here are some nice pictures I found online, um, and they highlight different sort of issues of influence. So here um, we have the original data, you can see with no outliers. Here's basically the same <coughs> data where there are some outliers, uh, or there is an outlier, I should say, but that outlier just happens to have very little influence on the model. I mean, to be clear, it's not always the case that outliers have influence. They often do, but they don't always. And so that's why we sort of want to in investigate influence. So here's one where, you know, the values for leverage, the values for Cook's distance are fairly small. Um, you can see there, and if you just sort of eyeball the little dotted line, it's pretty clear that the presence of that outlier doesn't really throw off the model too much. Here's an interesting case where there's an outlier that has a lot of leverage, but very little Cook's distance. It just happens to be the case. If you look at those calculations there, um, the uh, Cook's distance is basically zero. Leverage is fairly large. Um, and you can see if you kind of squint at the little dotted line that uh, this case has influence, but it's not influence that particularly throws off a lot of the estimation of the other cases in the model. And then finally, there's, a, there's an example of uh, data where we have an outlier which has both a lot of uh, influence in terms of its leverage and a lot of influence in terms of its Cook's distance. And if you, again, look at the little dotted line, you can see here, um, this uh, outlier really pulled the model off from where, in a sense, it should be. Now, why is it the case that sometimes the outlier really has a ton of influence, sometimes it doesn't? It's hard to say precisely, but what it has to do is the 
what it has to do with is the relative position of any data point with respect to all the other data points. So in a sense, sometimes you get unlucky and your outlier has a ton of influence. Sometimes it doesn't matter as much. Uh, in any case, it's worth investigating outliers, as I've now repeatedly said in this class, but it's also interesting to consider outliers in terms of how much influence they have. Okay, moving on a little bit. What do we do? Well, like I said, you should really consider multiple sources of evidence when thinking about uh, influence. You should think about influence in terms of how much the model, uh, how much a particular case distorts the model's prediction of it. You should also think about how much a uh, particular case distorts the model's prediction of the other cases in the data set. That's more of like the cooks and the leverage and stuff like that. There are also some other measures to consider. One of these is called DF betas. These are just differences between the regression coefficients in the model using all the cases and when the case is excluded. So this is a little bit like adjusted predicted values. SPSS is going through and temporarily pulling out ID number one and creating a model that is creating a, a regression equation with a slope and an intercept and so on. And then it'll put those in the data set for you to look at and you can compare those to the original uh, models uh, regression coefficients when the model was made with all the data. And you again kind of look to see how much does the model change, how much does the slope change, how much does the intercept change when you've pulled out a particular case. If that case was kind of uninfluential then probably those regression coefficients don't change very much. If the case was very influential then pulling out that one case should result in a pretty big shift in where the slope is, where the, the intercept is for the model. And oh boy, would you believe it, there's a standardized version of DF betas, and this is just an adjustment, uh, or not really an adjustment, a transformation that's applied to those regression coefficients to make it a little bit easier to eyeball big values. And, and just as a really simple rule of thumb, you should look for values for, of standardized DF betas that are bigger than one or less than negative one, and certainly ones that are bigger than two and less than, or less than negative two. Those just suggest big shifts in the slope uh, and the intercept of the model when you've pulled out a particular case and uh, kind of run the analyses again. So the point of all these diagnostics, and here again, we're, you know, broadly speaking, we're talking about the whole suite of regression diagnostics tools, is to highlight interesting cases. Um, and once you've highlighted them, once you've found that ID number two has a ton of influence, or ID number three has a really weird outlier with respect to its residual, um, you need to ask, you know, why is it the case? And, uh, you know, I've sort of repeated myself a bunch of times, uh, but forgive me, I'll do it again. As I think of it, there are two broad reasons why we can have weird uh, cases in our data set. One is that we got bad data from the participant. Maybe the participant was confused or careless. Maybe there was equipment failure. One way or the other, we can think of this stuff as like measurement error. Another problem is maybe this person really shouldn't be part of the population we're studying. Maybe he or she kind of wandered in to our sample, not from the population we're interested in, whether that's college students or psychiatric inpatients or people with eating disorders or whatever our population is, but they're really part of some other population. And uh, if it is the case that you have an unusual, well, case in your data set, an unusual person in your data set, and you can connect their unusualness to one of these two reasons, then maybe you have a, a case made. Gosh, I'm using the word case a bunch, but maybe you can justify, let's say, doing something with the data. And by doing something with the data, I, there are basically three main strategies. We can remove the case from the data set. We can say, okay, ID number one, you're out of there. You're, you're screwing up the model for everyone. Um, you can change the data. You can say, well, you know, ID number one is an outlier um, and we can adjust that by bringing in his or her value on the outcome variable, bringing it to a fence or Windsorizing it. Or we can maybe even transform the entire data set. Um, now, I'm not talking about that too much in this lecture, but I do have a supplemental lecture that's available on YouTube, <clears throat> maybe some of you have already watched it, called Dealing with Problem Data or something like that. And I go through different strategies for dealing with problematic data, including data that might have weird outliers or uh, undue influence or so on. So if you haven't already watched that video, by all means do.
I think it'll give you some more information, the information that I'm not going to take the time to repeat right now. I'm not going to take the time to repeat it because I'm moving on. I want to talk a little bit about multiple regression. Multiple regression is just uh, you know a type of analysis we do where we have two or more predictor variables. Here you can see an image. Um, for a second, I thought this was something that uh, a piece of analysis that I did. It's funny. It's been such a long time. <laughs> I think this is something that my wife and I did, where we were looking at the relationship between uh, behavioral activation system drive. That's a variable and drive for muscularity behaviors, I think, that's an outcome variable, um, in both men and women. So we have two predictor variables, BAS drive and gender. We have one outcome variable, DMS behaviors, and there you have it, a multiple regression. Gosh, I'm, it's, my memory is so weird today. It's, again, blame it on Wednesday. Anyway, the point is, um, if we have two or more predictor variables, we're in the world of multiple regression. Um, and this is important because really most variables, or I should say most outcome variables that we study in psychology are multiply determined. If you think about almost anything, you know, you know, p consumer behavior, eating disorder symptoms, you know, reaction time on a computer task, memory, almost everything we care about in psychology probably is influenced by more than just one predictor variable. So we're almost always doing some sort of multiple regression type analysis in most of the work we do. And by way of an example here, um, if you're enrolled in my class, I have a data set called record sales number two, um, which is just a further continuation of that one uh, record sales data set, except now there are two predictor variables. Um, you can also get this from Andy Field's uh, website for his textbook if you're not enrolled in my class. So for instance, if you were trying to predict people's uh, music pur purchases based on not just advertising budget, but also amount of radio airplay or amount of some other variable, as you keep adding variables, you're putting yourself more and more into the realm of, of, um, into the realm of multiple regression. So if we write out our model in terms of parameters, we could write out kind of, you know, data equals model plus error. We could expand our model there to show that we now have um, an intercept and a slope in the first predictor variable and a slope in the second predictor variable. So we take that and sort of shove it back into the original equation. We can write it all the way out like this. Data equals model plus error. And we could, of course, write the whole thing in terms of parameter estimates. That's just using little b's instead of the big b's. And just like we saw in simple regression, there are many different models that could fit our data. We want the model that fits the data best, which is going to be constrained um, to be a linear combination of predictor variables that correlate maximally with the outcome variable. So if that seems a little bit abstract, just consider that we're trying to put together our predictor variables, you know, radio, airplay, advertising budget in such a way that they are a combination variable or they're a combination of variables that correlate the best or the highest with our outcome variable. In the case of our example here, it's like record sales. Now in the case of our, our example here, again, record sales, we have two predictor variables so far. It's radio airplay and advertising budgets. And if you like to think geometrically, um, then that model is now no longer a straight line. It is now a flat plane. By flat plane, I just mean a plane that does not curve. You could actually sort of picture this in space. On the y-axis, kind of going up, if you will, is record sales. And on the x-axis, kind of going along the base, is a um, uh, number of radio airplays. And then you can think about uh, the other uh, base, which is sort of descending or moving into the background is advertising budget. So we sort of imagine this in three-dimensional space. Instead of having just a line, we now have a plane which slices through like a, like a samurai sword through that cloud of dots. And that plane is our model. We're just trying to describe the intercept and now not one slope, but two slopes. So we got, here's our intercept. Here's a slope for our first predictor variable. Right, I'm sorry, I guess it's our second predictor variable. And here's our slope for our first predictor variable. Now this is relatively easy to do if you have two predictor variables. Uh, now if you have four or five or six uh, predictor variables, you get into some pretty weird and hard to visualize geometrical space. 
But the good news is the principle still is the same. You can still write out a model that has two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight predictor variables. It's a little harder to visualize it in space, but the math works the same. And, and to be clear, most of the math SPSS does for us, which is super handy. So in the case of more than one predictor variable, we have more than one correlation with the outcome variable. And we can express the relationship between these predictor variables and our outcome variable in terms of the multiple correlation coefficient. It's instead of just having a regular correlation, which is the case when we have one predictor variable, now we have multiple correlation, which is just the correlation between the value of the outcome variable and the value predicted by the model. So how well does our model predict that outcome variable? And conveniently, we can square multiple r to give us multiple r squared, which is just like, well, it can be interpreted like any other r squared. It's just the portion of variance in the outcome variable that's accounted for or associated with the model. Now, if, any, if all this is seeming a bit abstract, let's go back to our example here of record sales. We're trying to predict record sales uh, for a new release based on 200 previous releases. And let's imagine we have three predictor variables. We've got advertising, airplay, and some sort of rating of the attractiveness of the band. So our predictor variables are advertising budget in thousands of British pounds, airplay in terms of number of plays per week on BBC Radio 1. Again, this is a British example. And then some sort of like focus grouped scale score on how attractive the band is. Presumably people buy more records from attractive bands than not. I don't know. <laughs> maybe they do, maybe they don't. These days I just buy music for my kids and uh, almost all of it is, uh, is pretty weird and not the sort of stuff I would be into if I was single and did not have kids. Anyway, our outcome variable is uh, record sales in thousands of units. And I guess this example is getting a bit old nowadays. People probably don't buy that many records. They download or stream. But let's say we have some sort of marketing outcome variable for like how much people are buying or streaming our new record. So in SPSS, we're doing this <coughs> very easily um, as a multiple regression. And we're specifically going to do a multiple hierarchical regression, something I'll talk about a little bit next time. But we're going to go in, uh, kind of like we did before, uh, analyze regression linear. Our outcome variable is record sales. Our predictor variable is first advertising budget. Then if you click on the next button, you'll see that the, the um, workspace will change from block one of one to block two of two. And in that second block, enter the variables, number of radio plays, and attractiveness of the band. Essentially what we're doing here is a hierarchical regression where we're first testing an augmented model that has only advertising budget, then we're testing an augmented model that has advertising budget, radio airplay, and attractiveness. And why we're doing this is just just because, uh, but we'll see in future lectures this strategy of doing a hierarchical regression can help us determine whether a predictor variable that we add to a model improves the fit of the model above and beyond predictor variables that are already in the model. So here it's like we, if we had some hypothesis we're testing like, gosh, does a uh, number of radio airplays and attractiveness make the model fit the data better than just advertising budget? We could test that hierarchically. Anyway, after you've entered that second block of predictor variables, you can click on statistics and you can ask for confidence intervals for your regression coefficients. You can ask for R squared. Um, you can ask for part and partial correlations, although I think in today's example, I'm not going to talk about those too much. And gosh, if you wanted to, if you're really inspired, you could uh, go to save and save out some standardized and unstandardized residuals and maybe even save out some of those regression diagnostic calculations I talked about before. But for the time being, I'm not going to talk about that stuff, so maybe you can just skip that. Anyway, once you got all your settings dialed in, hit OK. So again, I'm sorry, a quick pop up here, I forgot. Um, we're creating two blocks of predictors to do a hierarchical multiple regression. Anyway, once you get all that done, you get some output and it looks like this. We have a model summary, but now we have two models in our model summary. 
Technically, there's three models, because one's our compact model, which isn't pictured here. But that first model, what's called model one, is just the model that contains only advertising budget. You can see the little, sub, uh, the little footnote there. Our second model is the model that contains advertising budget, attractiveness, and radio airplay. And you can see the value for R squared for each of those models, and you can see the change in R squared, how much the model improves from the addition of those extra predictor variables. So, you know, we've got R, and really multiple R, we've got R squared, and we've got R squared change, the change that we get from adding additional predictor variables to the model. We also conveniently get a significance test that tells us if that change in, um, and R squared is statistically significant. In this case, it is. R squared goes from uh, 0.335 to 0.665. That's obviously a jump of 0.33, and that jump in R squared um, is a uh, has a significance level that's well below, or as you know, p value that's well below 0.05. So we'd say, ah, there's a statistically significant improvement in fit for the model when we add those additional predictor variables. Sliding down, we get our ANOVA table, which again just tests the overall model. In the first case, or the first version of the augmented model that has just advertising budget, statistically significant. Second version of the advertising budget, uh, second version of the model, which contains advertising budget, attractiveness, and radio airplay, also statistically significant. A little bit redundant with the previous model summary, but just more ways of thinking about the data. This rather fussy looking uh, table here is our table of regression coefficients, including those correlations uh, at the back. And once we've got all this information, we can actually write out the model. So we could, uh, you know, develop the version of the augmented model, uh, write it out, you know, uh, y hat sub i equals b sub zero plus b sub one x sub one b sub two x sub two b sub three x sub three and we can substitute in the unstandardized regression coefficients for those different values for the intercept for the slope that describes the effect of uh, advertising budget for the slope that describes the effect of radio airplay and for the slope that describes the effect of attractiveness and although i didn't highlight it you might have also seen earlier that well, actually, I guess I did say it, um, that with all these predictor variables in the model, we account for 66% of the variance in record sales, which is quite a bit more than we originally did, which was like 33%. So there's a lot that we haven't talked about yet, or I haven't talked about yet in terms of multiple regression. Um, I've just kind of thrown a bunch of stuff at you. Um, I've talked a little bit about correlations and whatnot. Next time around, uh, we'll spend some more time digging into multiple regression. And we'll also do a little bit of practice looking for outliers and influential cases so we can really get comfortable using those regression diagnostics. All right, uh, if you made it this far in the lecture, thank you very much for your attention. I'm always grateful for the people watching all this stuff. Um, that's all I have to say to you right now uh, because I'm tired and it's Wednesday. Uh, but I will be back with another lecture uh, very soon. And so in the meantime, just relax, have a cup of tea, have a cup of coffee, sit back, let all this stuff soak in, and I hope it all makes good sense to you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.